We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are, are all united. united. Workshop. The theme of our workshop is a meaningful standard for necessary scope of PI protection. This event is hosted by CSAC together with the China Internet Development Foundation, China Foundation of Internet Societies, Fuxi Institution, and the China Lives. And I'm the host today. The COVID-19 pandemic has an accelerate digital transformation and uh, heightened the urgency for governments to tackle with this progress, uh, process. How to strengthen the protection of personal information and regulate its governance and how to make a proper use of digital data for global benefits and major challenges facing us all. Against this background, it is a great pleasure to invite renowned experts in this field to discuss how to establish a basic governance framework for the collection and the processing of personal information and other data, and to showcase the best practice of different countries and regions. Through us, facilitating the establishment of international universal standards for the collection of PI. Now, I suggest our guest speaker say hi to everybody because we are online and offline and uh, maybe wave your hand, okay? Let's shake hand, all right. Thank you. Let's start our workshop. Due to the limited time, every speaker, please make sure your speech is delivered within three, seven minutes so that all our guest speakers have enough time to share you, their opinions. Thank you. Today, we're honored to have Mr. Xu Feng here with us. He is the Deputy Director General of the International Cooperation Bureau, Cyberspace Administration of China. Let's applaud to welcome Ms. Xu to address. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good evening, and good night. It's an honor for me to be invited to this workshop. On behalf of the International Cooperation Bureau of the Cyberspace Administration of China, I would like to express our warm welcome to the participants and congratulations on this event. Now I will deliver my speech in Chinese. Currently, the COVID-19 is still affecting the world. The international travel had not come back to before. Based on the last year's IGF, which was hosted completely online, this year we're joining this online and offline forces showcasing the importance of the internet in the international communi uh, communication. Right now, it is already evening time in Beijing. For both offline and online, we still have so many people joining this event, which showcased everyone's focus on IGF as a platform and your attention to the issue of PI protection. For China, this year is a important one that bears fruit for data governance and data security. Since this year, we've issued several regulations, including the law on data security, as well as the PI protection law. We've also came out with different regulations on vehicle data security, as well as the different regulations on internet security, data protection, etc. 
So in the process of setting up those regulations and laws, China had maintained an open attitude. We've learned the experiences from EU's GDPR. And under this bilateral and multilateral collaboration framework, we had several rounds of discussions on the data flow across different borders. And we are setting up regulations and open to the public to solicit their opinions for both uh, domestically and internationally so that our channel can always be open. China had already set up the fundamental framework for data security governance. In this way, the confidence and trust of the public has been increasing. We've also noticed that the international community are bearing fruits in terms of data governance. All of this showcased that everyone is faced with challenges and issues, and we have a need as well as a foundation to seek common ground and to seek common solutions. When President Xi was attending the G20 summit, he pointed out that we can set up digital governance, international regulations, respecting everyone's interest and willingness and establish a fair and just as well as open digital development environment. China has always put a strong focus on the digital governance international collaboration, and we've put forth such initiative to promote the innovation and development of digital economy and to enhance PI protection as well as data security. China has already applied to join CPTPP as well as the Digital Economy Partnership, DEPA, which showcased our resolution as well as commitment to achieve win-win and the international communication collaboration. IGF is a very important internet governance platform under the UN framework. Today, we're discussing the PI protection, which is very meaningful and right uh, to time. This is time of discussion, and we can play a positive role here, and we are willing and open to discuss this with you and we hope that we can have strengthened collaboration in this regard cac will continue to work with different parties domestically and abroad to continue our discussion at last i wish this seminar a great success thank you thank you for your attention mr Xu. thanks now I will make a keynote speech on behalf of CSAC, distinguished guests online and offline. On behalf of Cybersecurity Association of China, I would like to express gratitude to the Secretariat of the United Nations Internet Governance Forum for providing such an exchange platform for us. Focusing on the theme of this workshop, I want to share some of our, my insights from the following three respects, aspects. Reflecting on the current situation of personal information protection in China, revealing existing rules and the practice of AI applications, and exploring the establishment of personal information protection, AI rules and the mechanisms that are collaborative, trustworthy, and the international community oriented. First, let's reflect on the current situation of PI protection in China. By June this year, the number of the China's netizens has reached 1 billion with the internet penetration rate reached 71.6%. The total number of the website is 4 million and that of mobile application is 3 million. Various applications are flourishing, fostering new business model and influencing almost all industry. In this way, applications have become a major force in the development 
of digital economy. However, some applications are collecting users' personal information beyond the proper scope, inferring on users' rights. Some applications ask for personal information authorization through the building of a functional services. Even concerning users' access to basic application foundational services if they refuse authorizations, which is a disused false claim. This has become a program to be sold. In addition, the leakage of personal information is serious. According to statistics, among the internet users who has ever encountered cybersecurity program, the preparation of this suffering personal information leakage is the highest at 23%. The China, Chinese government has attached great importance to data security and uh, PI protection. Concerning legislation on PI protection, China is a later stater, but a smarter raiser. Over this year, the country has been committed to enhance data security and the PI protection and has scored significant progress. A series of laws and regulations have been issued in this regard including the decision of safeguarding internet society issued in 2000, which is the first legislation on personal information protection. The decision on stringing the protection of network information in 2012, provisions on the protection of PI of telecommunication and the internet user in 2013, Cybersecurity laws in 2017, as well as the civil code, data security law, personal information protection law, the provisions of the scope of necessary people, uh, personal information required for common types of mobile internet applications, and the regulations on protecting the security of critical information infrastructure this year. And other draft regulations are under deliberation. All of these laws and regulations have put forward clear requirement for personal information protection from different levels, improving the legislative system and the framework for personal information protection. At the same time, we have launched a public city campaign of data security and PI protection. Every year, we hold PI Protection Day during the National Cybersecurity Publicity Week. Hold an open forum on the theme of data governance, data, data governance and personal information protection during the Wooden Summit WIC. All this effort aims to encourage and motivate the general public to promote data security and PI protection so that our people immediate interest can be preserved. Thanks to the, this joint effort for all the parties, the awareness, regulation, and the governance of PI protection have been steadily improved. Moreover, we have enhanced in exchange and cooperation with the international community to improve the data governance and the PI infringement striving to create a safe, reliable data ecosystem. As China supports the civil society in the field of the cybersecurity, CSAC have been actively engaged in the process of PI protection. We have undertaken the work of handling compliance and reporting on improper in legal pra uh, practice of uh, applications. This is a meaningful task. A lot of support has been uh, provided for citizens to better protect their personal information when using applications. Besides, 
We have also organized the drafting of industrial level self-regulation convention, calling on our member un units and the uh, industrial peers to jointly enhance personal information protection awareness and the capability building. Secondly, let's review the existing rules and the participate of AI application. At pre uh, present, AI has been integrated with 5G, cloud computing, big data, and other digital technology. Becoming a new form of infrastructure to empower all the works of life. Amid the pandemic, AI has once again spoke for itself. However, the application of AI has reignited concern about privacy, data protection, and uh, undue use of data. As more and more personal information is being collected, processed, stored, or used in all possible forms, smart terminal enabled by AI, and the AI revolution from weak AI to strong AI require massive data support which increases the risk of personal information explored and uh, data misuse. Since they are uncertainty in AI technology itself, the rule making regarding AI applications required continuously exploration and research by all stakeholders. China is highly committed to the development and application of AI and its governance. For example, in 2018, China's National Standardization Committee issued the white paper on AI standardization. In 2019, the New Generation Artificial Intelligence Government's Expert Committee issued the principle of new generation of AI, developing responsibility AI. In 2020, Cyberspace Administration of China and the four other government departments jointly issued the guide to the building of national standard framework for new generation artificial intelligence. In 2021, the new generation AI government expert committee released the new generation artificial intelligent code of ethics. Recently, the recommendation of the ethics of the AI has been adopted by UNESCO's general conference at its 41st session. The recommendation is the first global regula uh, regulatory framework on AI, enduring countries within the responsibility to apply it in corresponding fields. Its lens has filled in the gap in global framework our guidelines on AI. CSAC have been, has been actively involved in the field of AI governance exploring the healthy path of AI development. In last year, with the guidance and the support of the CSC, we initiate the establishment of the AI security innovation platform and the Intelligent Network Security Research Center. In addition, we have been drafting a group level standard or guideline for AI security, cooperating with the universities research institutions, com companies, and other stakeholders. We are trying to make the best of our resources to explore innovative practice of AI governance and development. In the end, I would like to give some advice, that is to establish a set of parental information protection, AI rules and the mechanisms that are collaborative trustworthy and the international community oriented. Amid the pandemic and in the post pandemic era, it is a must to establish the global recognized rule of a framework on personal information protection and AI application to enhance capability building. In achieving this goal, CSAC is willing to join hand with all stakeholders motivator and organize our member companies to provide products, services, technologies, and the talent support for building a safer, safer uh, cyberspace and a better protecting people's personal information. It is recommended 
that the United Nations established a human-centered global universal rules and the framework for PI protection and AI. In this process, it is hoped that the UNIGF will play a great role in guiding more stakeholders to engage and jointly improve the establishment of a side of collaborative, trustworthy, and the international community-oriented personal information protection, AI rules, and mechanisms. In this way, the mankind can hopefully, uh, hopefully embrace a healthy, sustainable AI future. So that's all for my speech. Thank you. Thank you all. Now, let's welcome Dr. Joanne Kubalat Loja, uh, Executive uh, Director of Diplo Foundation, Head of Geneva Internet Platform, from Executive Director of the Secretariat of the High Level Panel of Digital Cooperation of UN to deliver a speech. Professor, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. I'm uh, really honored yes. and pleased to uh, address the workshop and also to hear the updates on developments in uh, China on the question of privacy information or what is called also data protection. And uh, there, is a, there are different uh, terminologies that we probably in the, in the, the progress of international uh, cooperation and activities, we will have to uh, harmonize also terminology that we use to that we, we have a full awareness that we, we uh, discuss uh, similar or the, or the same things. Uh, it, is, it is really uh, important to hear about major developments that are happening in China, including Data Privacy Protection Act that you established, and the various linkages uh, which you highlighted, especially towards uh, artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. And my intervention will be basically focusing on the questions on the main tendencies that are happening in Geneva, where I'm connecting from, and internationally when it comes to this, uh, this issue. First major tendency is a shift towards something that can be called a digital self-determination or a, a data self-determination, which is aimed at putting data in the, hon in the hands and control of citizens. There is a, a Swiss digital self-determination initiative and there are other initiatives in Finland and other countries aimed basically that citizens have a full uh, control of their data. And that it is a precondition for uh, economic activities, for enjoyment of uh, human rights and for human dignity and core values that internet should promote and protect. Therefore, this is the first point which is uh, which is quite important. Therefore, moving data towards citizens from the big, especially tech platforms uh, that exist all over the world. And that's empowering citizen and then empowering also local communities and bottom up building some new data infrastructure, which would ensure human centered approach with full respect for human dignity, cultural and local diversities, which is very important. Internet is integrated system, but impact of the internet is very often local, depending on cultural and other specificities in communities worldwide. This is the first point that I wanted to highlight as a general, general tendency. The second point uh, related to data is a question of interoperability. Or let me give you a very practical example. With mobile telephony, you can switch between operators by keeping your phone number and uh, basically exploring what is the best option on the market. When it comes to the social media platforms all over the world, you cannot do that. You may get your data, but you cannot 
uh, go now, let me take a few examples from Facebook to, to uh, Telegraph or uh, Signal or whatever platform. I'm not very familiar with the Chinese platforms, WeChat and the others, but uh, you may download your data from, let's say, Facebook, but you cannot bring your data and your network, what is extremely important, and then go for the best uh, option on the market. Therefore, the question of interoperability and possibility to choose uh, optimal platform is the second, I would say, big issue. It's related to self-determination to some extent. And the sooner or later, it will, uh, it will come on the, on the national agendas and the global agendas uh, for various reasons. One is protection of the market, digital market. The other is uh, protection of individual right to make a choice. And, uh, and the third one is to uh, protect the vibrancy of the overall social and economic system in the country. Therefore, this is the second point. And it's a very simple question. Can we do in social networks what we can do in mobile telephony? That's bottom line. The third point, which is emerging and you alluded in your, your, in your introduction and, uh, and uh, um, the head of international relations from the cybersecurity authority, as well as question of artificial intelligence. Because data is important part or, or the uh, private information, uh, but when, what it really matters is the question of the wisdom and the patterns the detected from the data. And on that point, uh, we heard that UNESCO has moved with the recommendations on the ethics and AI, and we can expect more and more activities. Ultimately, here the point is how we are going to preserve cultural heritage of societies worldwide, from China, Europe, United States, Africa, and Latin America, which is increasingly codified through algorithms and the, and the, and the data. Patterns in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the way how we learn, how we interact. And ultimately, one question which will come sooner or later on the agenda, and UN Secretary General already highlighted this question, is the question, what are we going to leave to the future generation? In his uh, uh, report, our common uh, agenda, he called countries, societies worldwide to start negotiating what he called social contracts. It won't be social contracts signed on the dotted line, but it will be understanding what we expect as a society from digital technology and in particular artificial intelligence. What will be our role as a humans? Are we going to keep the, the, let's say, central role in society as we have been doing through last 20 centuries, 25 in different traditions from Confucius, Taoism to Christianity, Islam, and uh, but human has been in the center of development. Is it going to continue? This is really open question with special universal artificial intelligence. Second point is, would we uh, be able to preserve our uh, core values and dignity in these developments. And third point is what we are going to pass to the next generation in terms of nature, and there are obviously there are discussions on environment, but also in terms of culture. How the next generation will get access to great thinkers from Chinese history, from Confucius to Lao Tzu and others. What about Aristotle in, uh, in, uh, in the European tradition? This question will be coming more and more on the agenda as artificial intelligence is, uh, is moving forward. Therefore, in brief, I wanted to uh, make these three points. The question of digital uh, self-determination and empowering citizens through regulations, through business practices to have a hold of their data, first point. Second point, ensuring interoperability that uh, a market and creativity in the, in the societies worldwide uh, can flourish. 
and here the metaphor is the simple shift from one mobile operator to the other, how we can do it, <clears throat> I'm sorry, with the social networks. Can we do, can we replicate that? And third point is how to ensure regulation of artificial intelligence, not only for our current generation, you in the room, us people who are following us, but even more, how we can ensure it for the future generation, how we are going to pass to them what we got from our predecessors in terms of culture, education, and, uh, and overall uh, cultural heritage of each society uh, worldwide, but also common heritage uh, that, uh, that we have as, as humanity. Those issues are not certain, and we have to sometimes make precautionary moves to ensure that we as a generation deliver to the next generation what we got from the previous one. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kubalija. Uh, we, we know that you provide a greater contribution on internet governance theories research, especially on the capacity building framework design. Uh, just now you gave us a very insightful speech. Thank you very much. So uh, now let's welcome Dr. Luca Bailey, Professor of Internet Governance and Regulations at Foundation uh, Gatileo Vargas Law School to, to give us a speech. Luca, are you here? Good morning to everyone. And thank you very much to, for the kind invitation to join this really excellent uh, debate. Uh, can you confirm you can hear me well? Yes. Uh, can uh, can I, I'm just going to, to share a quick presentation and I think it's very good to have scheduled my presentation right after Jovan's presentation, because I'm going really to, we, I, I, I promise we have not synced our notes, but my presentation will really be compatible with what uh, uh, Jovan just said and actually will allow to, to dig a little bit deeper in these details uh, and from both from the Brazilian and from the, the BRICS perspective. So I'm gonna share uh, one second my presentation. Uh, please let me know if you are saying it, if you're seeing it. Yeah. Yes, excellent. So uh, first of all, just a couple of uh, introductory elements. Uh, as you were mentioning, I work at FGV uh, which is uh, one of the main Brazilian uh, uh, academic institutions. It's also a, a think tank, uh, and uh, it is uh, now considered uh, the third most influential think tank. Sorry, in the Luca, world. please use a full screen. Yes, I, it is in full screen in this moment. Uh, can you? Okay, host, please uh, transfer to full screen. Can you see it in full screen now? In, I can see it in full screen on my on my screen. Can you confirm on your hand it is in full screen? Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, so my presentation will be about three main points. Uh, first, the process, uh, analyzing the, the, the Brazilian experience, the process that allowed to uh, reach a very modern framework, at least on paper in Brazil, uh, what is the substance of this framework? And then how does this compare with other frameworks in the BRICS grouping that you know is, are, are, it's quite relevant for me and for my work. So when we speak about BRICS, we speak about Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, a very uh, special grouping uh, on which I developed some work over the past years. And uh, so uh, at FGV, I, I had, I, I'm the director of the Center for Technology and Society, which is the first center that has been uh, created to discuss the impact of technology on society in Brazil uh, 20 years ago, almost. And over the past years, I've been directing this project called Cyber Bricks, which analyzes digital policies in the BRICS. And it's particularly interesting for me today to share some of the findings of our analysis. Uh, and especially, I will start with the Brazilian data protection law uh, called the LGPD from its Brazilian acronym, Lei Geral de Proteção de Dados. And uh, so the, the, very, the, the first point I want to stress is that having a general data protection law, it's very useful because it has an harmonizing effect. 
streamlining and unifying data protection principles, rights, obligation, and oversight mechanism. And so before LGPD, so before our general data protection law, like the people uh, that has been adopted in China recently, uh, we had a very fragmented uh, uh, scenario in, in, in Brazil with regard to data protection. There were already more than 40 different laws, sectorial laws that sometimes were even contradictory. The LGPD that is largely based on existing uh, frameworks, especially European frameworks, brings in a, this harmonizing effect with a unique general law. Uh, the uh, process to achieve this framework has not been uh, very quick. It, it took more than 10 years to, to achieve a very modern framework. So as you see here, these are the main steps you can uh, find. First, an initial consultation already 11 years ago in 2010 that started together with another consultation that then attracted much more attention, the one on the Marcos Villa Internet, the Brazilian digital rights framework that was launched by the, the my center CTS FGV together with the Brazilian Ministry of Justice and the CGI uh, and then attracted much more attention and then the uh, result of this other consultation about the Marcos bill was the approval of this law uh, after the Snowden uh, revelations in 2014 that provided this, a concrete push a concrete political push for the approval of the law then after the approval of this law another cons a second consultation on a data protection bill was launched in 2015. And then again, some external pressure, external events, the Facebook Cambridge Analytical scandal and the adoption of GDPR in Europe uh, led to the political push at, you know, at the internal level to approve this new uh, bill that became our LGPD. Uh, also another very important element of political pressure was the intention of Brazil to accede the OECD where being part, having integrated the recommendation on the privacy and transnational data flows uh, is an, ent an interesting element to uh, being considered as suitable to be a member of OECD. Then uh, in starting from 2020, the law LGBT starts to enter in force partially and fully enters in force in 2021 in August. So now the law in fully in force, also a new authority has been created and importantly, very importantly, only a couple of months ago, the Brazilian Congress created a new fundamental right to data protection enshrined in the Brazilian constitution in Article 5. So now we have a very similar approach to the European model, if you want, at least on paper. And we will see why this is not only really the, the, what corresponds to, to, to the, to the, to the uh, reality. So if you want to read the law, we have translated it in English. You can find it on cyberbrace.info or using this mini URL that you see here. And the law has a very didactic structure that you see here. Uh, so a many of, of such elements, however, still need to be specified. So it's very important. That is the second point I want to stress. It is very good to have a law because it's a, it has an harmonizing effect. But then the law has to be specified because frequently elements of the law are vague and need specification. So you need a very good regulator that can do this specifying and implementation uh, work. And you need a lot of further additional work to implement and to specify the law. So a new uh, authority has been created and the authority is tasked to oversee the implementation of the law and to, in, to, to specify many of these elements. You see here the fundamental uh, principles that are listed in Article 6 of the law. Uh, that are uh, common to uh, many of the other most recent frameworks around the world. Importantly, and here is a point that I want to stress because Jovan mentioned it before, it's not mentioned here, but in Article 2 of the law, uh, one of the founding elements of the law is the principle of informational self-determination, which is uh, basically pretty much the uh, uh, forefather of, of, of what Jovan was mentioning, uh, digital self-determination. So informational self-determination is a very well-known principle in data protection law established in the, in the, uh, by the uh, German federal court as a fundamental right in 1983 with the census case and has been integrated by the Brazilian legislator as a founding principle of the Brazilian framework as well. Uh, if we check also the, what are the rights that are of, uh, uh, granted to all data subjects at the Brazilian level, these are, they are also very common to the last generation of data protection laws, including some very recent 
uh, rights like the right to data portability, to anonymize, data anonymization, and oversight, of, and, sorry, and review, sorry, of the uh, automated decisions. So these, again, two very important points. Uh, the right to data portability is what Yovan was mentioning before about interoperability is de facto uh, uh, implemented legally by the right to data portability. So to, import, to export your data and import them into another service, which is some, something uh, quite uh, widespread in recent data protection framework like GDPR in Article 20 or LGPD in Article 18, or even the people, the, 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 the general data protection law of China. So it's something that is at least on paper integrated by recent frameworks, but de facto in practice needs interoperability standards to be something that can be fully enjoyed by the user, which is something not, uh, not uh, uh, existing yet, at least generally adopted at the international level. Uh, the authority that will help us enjoy this right is the uh, ANPD, the new data protection regulator of Brazil that has been created exactly one year ago, and that will also have the possibility to define these technical standards at the Brazilian level, together with a, a large number of, a, of, a very, of other very urgent tasks. And let me share here with you the uh, agenda that has been published by the ANPD in, in January this, this year. Uh, and uh, you see what you they, they plan to start in to, in to start not to have finished 2021 and 2022 is already a lot but if you check for instance data portability standards which is something they could do according to article 40 of the law is not even in the in the agenda so it's something that maybe will happen after 2022 as a, 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 the beginning of this work. So there are a lot of very key elements to implement the law that still are completely not specified by the regulator. Uh, and the, the, the result of this is that there is a, a huge discrepancy between what the law says and what happens in reality. Uh, and that, the recent data leakages that we have witnessed almost on a weekly basis in January, the entire uh, the, the data, the personal data of the entire Brazilian population were available on the darknet, we discovered. Uh, this witness that there is a, a, a huge discrepancy between the theory, the, what the law says, and the reality. And also let's think another further element that I want to share with you in terms of really practical thinking and pragmatic thinking. The ANPD, our Brazilian data protection regulator, has a staff of 36 people, 36, which makes it very, very challenging to oversee uh, in an efficient and effective way, data protection in a country of 110 million individuals, where data protection is really a quite new issue. Now, how this compares with uh, the BRICS countries that are a grouping that I really enjoy analyzing? Well, you see here our uh, comparative tools for data protection regulations in the BRICS countries that you can find freely on data protect on uh, CyberBRICS. Info, uh, where we compare very all the ele main elements of the uh, of the data protection frameworks of the BRICS countries, and if you want to actually to uh, this, to have a, a, a more complete picture, you can also find on CyberBRICS or Info our book that we launched this year on CyberBRICS cybersecurity regulations in the BRICS, where we analyze five key dimensions of cybersecurity in the BRICS: data protection, consumer protection, cyber crime preservation of public order online and cyber defense. So this, this and a lot of other publications, all free in, and freely available online, uh, are available on, on cyberbricks.info. And so what did our finding demonstrate? Our finding demonstrate there, there is an increasing convergence on data protection at the BRICS level. Uh, this convergence is mainly evident on this uh, key uh, elements that you see here. So a shared principle uh, basis uh, in all countries, uh, remarkably similar uh, individual rights, uh, remarkably comparable sets of obligation, and also a very strong attention to uh, international data transfers uh, that are only possible, uh, as Europe uh, uh, foresees in this framework, only when the uh, third party, third country, or, or the third party processing data has adequate level so substantially similar level of protection authorized by the national authorities. So uh, this has uh, led me to uh, uh, pen this paper on uh, uh, data protection in the BRICS countries, enhanced cooperation convergence towards legal interoperability. And here again, 
I join what Jovan was saying. This is something I've published for the, for the uh, Chinese Academy of Cyber, Cyberspace Studies uh, last year as a contribution to the, to the uh, World Internet Conference. It's free available again on the uh, Cyberbricks website. There is also a Chinese version available if you want. And here, my last point with which I would like to conclude is that the, this key point of preserving data privacy and also using it as a fundamental dimension of the security of ICTs is something that has been consistently stressed by the BRICS leaders over the past eight years at least and became even more prominent at the last BRICS meeting. I uh, just published uh, two an essay and an article about this, so about the convergence in uh, data protection and cybersecurity at the BRICS level. And what is very interesting that you see here, and that will be my last point, that the BRICS leaders finally crossed the Rubicon and mentioned explicitly the need to enhance cooperation to the adoption of uh, 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 BRICS legal frameworks on cybersecurity to enhance this cooperation and this harmonization also at the intra-BRICS level, at the pentalateral level, as they used to say. So I hope this was useful and I'm really available to any kind of questions and observations you might have. All the, the material I've shared is freely available online and I will be more than happy to share it with you and to all the participants after the, 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 this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your speech, Professor Luca Bailey. So um, now let's welcome Professor Xiao Dongli, founder and uh, CEO of Fuxi Institution, Director of Center for Internet Governance of uh, Tsinghua University, to deliver a speech. Xiao Dong, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, distinguished guest and friend, uh, even online or offline. And there is a good morning or good afternoon or good evening uh, depends on your time zone uh, this is Xiaolong Li it's my great honor to meet you at the 16th annual meeting of the internet governance forum IGF is a global platform under the framework of the United Nations which is dedicated to the discuss the internet governance issues uh, against the backdrop of a lack of unified data governance rules across the global it's necessary to have such a uh, constructive discussion. Uh, Fuji Institution is an international and uh, independent think tank and research institute. Uh, we try to promote economic and social uh, digital transformation and development. Uh, data governance have, has always been our uh, focus and research area. Today, I would like to share with you some of my, my observations and thoughts. Uh, first, data security and their personal information protection have received considerable attention, which are closely uh, related to the development of the digital economy in all countries, in all economies. And one of its final goals should be promoting the healthy development of the digital economy. The digital economy has become an important engine for economic growth, especially when the real economy has been affected by the pandemic. Statistics shows that the digital economy has accounted for more than 16% uh, of the GDP uh, in developed countries. For example, uh, Germany, uh, UK, and the United States. And especially China was uh, close to 40%. I think it's a very uh, big achievement after uh, the half, uh, more than half uh, century development of the internet itself. While uh, enjoying the benefit of data, uh, we have indeed encountered some problems such as data leakage, excessive collection of personal information and data abuse, uh, which have um, dented public trust in the digital age. Therefore, uh, major countries have stressed legislation and supervision and on data security. The requirement have been placed on data collection, uh, storage, utilization, and sharing. However, as data is one of the key factors of production in the digital economy, it's necessary to ensure its security 
as well as the free flow and effective use of data. Security should serve to promote development, which is a basic uh, precondition. Uh, second, as the major countries and regions carry out data governance practice based on their national conditions and have different priorities, they should fully communicate and learn from each other on the basis of mutual respect and understanding. Since countries and regions start the process of, of digitalization as at different times, they are in different stage of the digital economy and social development and have different level of data governance capabilities. Meanwhile, they have different cultural backgrounds and social cognition. So the method, focus, and the level of data governance practice will be different. For example, the GDPR focuses on strengthening individuals' control over their data, while at the same time trying to create a unified data market to facilitate the free flow of data, data within the EU. The United States, however, has been focusing on industrial in interests. Comprehensive legislation on data protection is mainly promoted by different states. And its cross-border data flow, the, I mean, the data flow rules and the framework of APAC are, are relatively relaxed. Uh, China's legislation on data has entered into a peak uh, period. It not only is established a comprehensive security framework legally, but also formally established data as a factor of production. Data governance is a new topic for the whole world. And we, can, we cannot judge which one is better or which one is, is worse. The excellent experience of all economies, all countries is worth studying or learning. Third, the sustainable development of the digital economy cost. Yeah, calls for uh, unified global data governance rules. We can learn from the modest stakeholder model of internet governance to build an international exchange and a cooperation mechanism to explore rough consensus on data governance. Data as a strategic resource is attracting attention from all countries, all economies. The number of countries and regions implementing data localization storage is increasing. And the threshold of cross-border data transformation is also on the rise, which will weaken the development of the data economy in the long run. Cross-border data flow contributed to the 10% of the global economy growth between 2009 to 2018, according to the research. The res restriction on data will lead to lower total trade up output, lower product productivities, and higher downstream pr price. Data needs to flow to maximize its value. To deal with the fragmentation and the campaign of data rules, we need to strengthen the international exchange and the cooperation of data governance, establish routine communication and cooperation mechanisms, seek solutions to regulation difference of all countries, find the greatest common divisor and advance the establishment of unified data governance uh, data management rules that conform to the requirement of most countries. Uh, due to the uh, data itself, the stakeholders may be uh, generated in each link of its life cycle. Therefore, we believe the multi-stakeholder model of internet governance can be used for reference in rule making in order to uh, fully utilize the rule of multi-stakeholders. It's only in this way I suppose we we'll come up with meaningful rules that do make, make sense. Many institutions and organizations, both in China and abroad, recently expressed their confusion and concern over current data governance uh, in communication with our organization. 
We also wish to stress in the international exchanges and cooperation about the digital economy and data management with our institute. We will unit the related institutions and actively promote the work from the perspective as an independent research, research institute. Today's workshop is attended by experts from China and scholars from Europe and Brazil, as well as online participants from other countries and regions. I sincerely welcome you to join our work and make suggestions. We can together make contributions to the development of global digital economy and the, the exploration of data governance rules. Uh, that's all, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Li. Now let's welcome Mr. Shen Qiang, Director of China Internet Development Foundation, President of Xiamen Meiya, Pico Information Call Limited. Professor Shen Qiang. Thank you so much. And uh, I will deliver my speech in Chinese as below. Distinguished delegates, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I am from Meiya Beko Information Com Company, and I am very pleased to be invited to, at to attend today's forum. My topic is to strike a balance between the AI development and the digital safety. In recent years, AI technology as the strategic technology leading up to the future has become an important engine in digitalization, IT application, and the uh, smart technology application. As the skyrocketing of the data amount and also the improvement of calculation capacity, as well as the application of deep learning, the AI technology has been largely promoted. But at the same time, it has brought about some brand new challenge. In the application of the scenarios, the AI technology, because of its technology nature and the society nature, as well as the in, uh, as well as the dependence on data as well, and the wide use, a series of uh, a, a series of data safety risks, including the over collection of personal data and the leakage of privacy has been posed. For example, the deep digging of data may lead to uh, may lead to abuse of data resources and the AI technology may be used to deeply counterfeiting data and impact on the decision making system. President Xi Jinping has emphasized that we need to analyze and prevent the potential risks posed by the development of AI to safeguard people's rights and the national safety and to ensure that the artificial intelligence can be safe, reliable, and controllable. The whole world has enhanced the forward-looking researches and the precaution and precaution precaution against the safety risks. I think we need to strengthen the following three aspects of work. First, we should strengthen the safety protection of AI product and the system data. We need to be issue oriented and uh, analyze the trend of technology and industrial development. We need to strengthen the R&D of AI data safety technology and build a dynamic AI R&D application assessment mechanism. Centering on the complication, risk, uncertainty, explainability, and the potential economic impacts, we need to develop some systematic assessment and testing method and the parameter system so as to promote the safety certification of AI and assess the safety of AI product and system. 
And second, we need to establish a sound, open, and transparent AI technology data safety and monitoring system. We need to strengthen the research and assessment on the impact of AI on national uh, safety and, and data protection. We need to improve a full and comprehensive safety protection system and we need to have the whole process supervision over the design of AI algorithm, development of products, and the application of outcomes. Third, we need to establish a, an ethical rules of the global AI technology. We need to strengthen international exchanges and dialogues and jointly make the AI ethical rules and frameworks. We need to strengthen the whole process legislation so that we can avoid any ethnicity issues as possible and to establish the laws and regulations across different steps, including the collection, storage, and usage of AI-related data. And we also need to avoid data abuse biases and infringement of personal privacy. We need to deepen the research of the issues of AI ethics so that we can provide this correct guidance in the society, build a positive development environment to strengthen the laws and regulation trainings for researchers, as well as um, step up the penalty level on the acts that data abuse, infringement of individual privacy and obeying ethics so that we can develop those industry regulation related to the different technology and standard to ensure the safety and development of AI. Thank you so much. Well, let's welcome Ms. Monica Wang, senior researcher of uh, Xi'an Jiao Tong University Suzhou Information Security Law Institute to give a speech. Um, good morning and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Monica Wang uh, from Xi'an Jiao Tong University. Sorry, we can't, we can't share the screen. Hello, please give the floor to the speaker now. Thank you. Can, can the moderator to share the screen? I, the speaker needs need the presentation present file. Wow, that's great. <laughs> so it's my honor being here to share some of my opinions about uh, protecting privacy in an AI driven world. Um, So with the rapid development of the internet, the importance of privacy protection is uh, increasingly recognized. Uh, more and more countries and organizations have put in place laws and regulations to protect the privacy. Uh, you know, after hundreds of laws such as uh, California Online Privacy Protection Act, Children's Online Privacy Protection Rule, US is considering a single principal data protection legislation with control our data Act. Uh, and the EU has GDPR. China introduced a personal information protection law this year. Uh, in 1990, UN provided 10 principles concerning the minimum guarantees to give country guidance when they need to regulate the computerized personal data. And today, we need to rethink the privacy protection legislation, since AI uh, is impacting our society, our life, and our economy. 
The current threat from AI have been discussed a lot, including uh, over collection of personal data, how to handle sensitive data, and how to ensure the data security. But AI itself also uh, an attack surface. Uh, model inversion, data poisoning, and adversarial sample pose a great risk to AI. The new threat act with the precision to destroy the AI security, integrity, and privacy. And since AI is a complicated system, even without any malicious attack, the unanticipated security concerning still exists. Uh, we also need to foresee the future threat may be relayed upon AI, while AI-centric decision-making replace human-centric decision-making. What should we do when we're facing the chaos of machine-to-machine -machine escalation? Uh, to protect privacy in an AI-driven world, maybe we need to do more. Um, here's my some, um, below my suggestions. Um, first, thing in the technical era, we need to develop advanced protection technology, uh, establish the risk assessment mechanism, uh, share best practice on model governance and cooperate on emergency response. And in the model governance area, ethics of AI is the core. Uh, data, algorithm, and performance, all of them should be taken and considered. Government, public, and private sectors, uh, more and more stakeholders should do contribution. Meanwhile, uh, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary and intercultural cooperation is necessary. Uh, technology specialists, um, sociologists, and children psychologists, different roles should be involved. And finally, about the laws and regulations. Um, National laws and regulations should be respected, and countries need to cooperate to set up international legal framework to guide privacy protecting while accelerating the AI progress. That's all of my painting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wang. Now let's welcome Mr. Zhao Hui, Secretary General of China Foundation of Internet Society. <clears throat> to give our speech to us. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and good morning. First of all, on behalf of one of the organizers, China Federation of Internet Societies, here in after CFIS, I'd like to thank you for your particip participation in this workshop. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to discuss with you the scope and standards of the collection and processing of personal information, as well as the relevant rules and practices concerning the application of AI in different countries. Nowadays, the internet and related technologies are facing revolutionary transform. Information gathering and the processing technologies based on big data, AI and the algorithms have become an important variable in building systems and the capacity for social governance, effectively conducting commercial and other social activities, and advancing the self-construction of individuals in cyberspace. Therefore, it is both obligated and necessary for worldwide governments, companies, NGOs, and the technology communities to keep perfecting rules and practices regarding application of AI from technological advances, individual rights, privacy protection, and the morality and ethics perspective. To better respond to the common concerns for all countries over data and the privacy protection, we believe the following principles must be followed when determining the essential scope, technical and the legal standards of gathering and the processing personal information. 
First, we must always adhere to the principle that the pursuit of technological advances and application should take individuals' dignity as a prerequisite. And we must not, not, not let technological progress and the commercial interests and the mind misuse or even infringe individuals' fundamental rights and freedom in cyberspace, especially data privacy rights. Along with other internet civil societies in China, CFIS will actively cooperate with the Chinese government to strengthen the publicity of laws and regulations, such as the Personal Information Protection Law. Since collecting and using personal data are inevitable, CFIS will advocate and promote the internet companies and related professionals to protect personal information, maintain authority and the social impact of their own and the industry, and establish a system for overseeing personal privacy protection. Secondly, to establish the necessary scope and the re relevant standards of personal information collection and the processing for the AI application use. We must build a fairer and more equitable global system for internet governance, stick to multilateral participation and give full play to the role of governments, international organizations, the internet companies, technology communities, NGOs, and the individuals. CFIS will give full play to its advantages and roles as an NGO. Actively advocate internet civil organizations of various levels and the internet companies to uphold the principle of sovereignty insist on dealing with issues over the internet governance under the UN mechanisms, especially those over personal data and the privacy protection, and stand firmly opposed to, opposed to hegemony in whatever form. Third, to establish the necessary scope and the relevant standards of personal information collection and the processing for the AI application use. We must seek to balance rights and obligation and set a more transparent relationship mode between the internet platforms and the users. And government supervision is also needed to prevent commercial uh, force from making profit continuously by taking adverse advantages of their own inherent advantages in capital, technology, and the monopoly due to data accumulation and the sacrificing the, pri uh, the privacy of ordinary users. As an important link between the government and the internet industry and the netizens, CFIS will continue to support internet civil organizations and companies to establish and improve codes and of practice of the industry and the self-discipline mechanisms for personal information protection. Moreover, CFIS will constantly strengthen the construction of self-discipline in the internet industry while facilitating individuals' life, the internet also put individuals at risk of personal information being collected, leaked, and used by criminal activities. I hope we can reach a consensus and the guidelines in this workshop, which will guarantee that we can enjoy the convenience brought by the internet while avoiding risks and the harms caused by the illegal use of personal data. That's all for today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Zhang.
Great thanks to all our guest speakers again for the insightful sharing. Next, we will move to the question and answer section. If you have any questions from for our guest speakers, please feel free to propose your question. We will choose three of them to discuss. So now uh, we invite questions. Let's control discussion time for each question within three minutes, shall we? I think that uh, first I want to ask some uh, offline uh, participant to share your idea, okay? Okay, first, uh, yes, uh, from China Line. Okay. Hello, so I'm from China Lab, and my name is Li He. Uh, my question is, um, since the outbreak of COVID-19, data had played a very important role in fighting the pandemic. Next February, China will host the Winter Olympic Games. So I wanted to ask, dear experts, so you think in different countries, uh, in Asia, Europe, and Americas, what are some very important experience of preventing the pandemic that we can learn from? How can we find a balance in between the information production as well as the data security and being connected overall? It's a Shen to give a few words, okay? <clears throat> 这个谢谢李贺啊您那个提问应该是两个问题啊 so, so you have two questions. The first is the experience of European countries and the USA and other countries. And also the second question is how to strike a balance between the data, uh, the interconnectivity and data protection. About the first question, I think Let's take the Tokyo 2020 games as an example in July, uh, because this is very uh, recent. And also it actually has the same scenario with the Olympic Winter Games. We have found some data from the internet. The Tokyo 2020 games, uh, actually the uh, pandemic situation in Japan in July, the new cases, the newly reported cases witness a actually a rapid growth. Um, the highest uh, is, was the 15,000 newly, newly reported cases on one day. But during the Tokyo 2020 games, the stakeholders, there are about 42,000 stakeholders entering Japan, but among them, only 150 were tested positive later. So it only about 0.4%. And they're actually, their countermeasures of COVID-19 is actually not new to China. Uh, one of them is the closed loop management. Actually, this is what we are very familiar with that. They have the PCR test every day. And actually this has been some daily routine in, in the big events in China. And this is to early detection, early discovery, identification of those cases. And second is the uh, restriction of the activity. Um, there are about 750 events, competitions during the Tok Tokyo 2020 games, but only 26 of them allow on-site spectators, only accounting for 7.5%. So these are very interesting, some new rules of the Olympic Games. Uh, for example, the uh, during the table tennis games, the athletes are not allowed to blow the uh, ball by mouth, and their hand and paws are not allowed to touch 
the table, et cetera. These are some interesting new rules. And, and third experience is the epidemiological research and survey. And in this aspect, the data interconnectivity has actually has actually played an important role. They used the two mobile apps to record uh, to record people's activity uh, track uh, to track the closed contacts. When people open, when people turn on the Bluetooth, and if a lot of people gather together for more than 15 minutes, this app will record this activity. And if one of these people are tested positive, other people will, will receive some notice. So I think this is what we can learn from Tokyo. But actually, part of these measures has been have been adopted in China. And the third, uh, second question is about how to strike a balance between interconnectivity and information protection. Well, I think the COVID-19 is actually an emergency in terms of public health. Actually, we have some legal foundation to collect personal information, uh, like the infectious disease prevention and control law, etc. But we still need to follow and observe related laws and regulations. The first is the minimize is to minimize the information collection. And the second is some the passive questions like uh, people can only use yes or no to answer those questions. And the original purpose of this big data to is to protect the public rights rather than infringe on personal rights. So we use smart, some smart technology uh, like in tracing uh, people's activity, etc. cetera. There's, uh, for example, in China, we use some mini programs to trace people's activity in the past 14 days, but it, this is only uh, can show the which city you have been in. And this uh, only to uh, only show the cities rather than very specific address. And the implementation of data safety law is actually first to ensure the effective protection. And the second is the legitimate usage of the data. So on one hand, we need to implementation some safety protection measures to prevent the uh, theft of this data. And second is to ensure that the utilization of data is legitimate. So actually uh, ob observing the laws and the regulations is the precondition. And there are two principles. The first is necessity and the minimization. And the second is uh, for example, if some people has been tested positive and some people has been um, some people has been identified as close contact, when we uh, release their information, we need to hide some sensitive information. So this is how we try to strike a balance between the interconnectivity and safety. Thank you for uh, information to Li He. It's OK? OK. Uh, um, uh, so uh, next, uh, who else uh, offline here? OK, Yuan Hui, please. Uh, uh, 
Okay, distinguished uh, guests, uh, my question is uh, faced with the actually transborder flow of uh, the data, how we can have cross-border management of this personal data and what kind of new technology can be applied to such trend, such cross-border data flow? The, the cross-border uh, management of the personal information protection uh, needs the collaboration between the policy research and the technology R&D. Uh, I think it, it was approved by the uh, development of the half century uh, internet uh, development. Uh, you know that the, the, the value of the data uh, was recognized by everybody. So everyone want to get data from others, but uh, nobody want to share the data with others. I think it's very ridiculous. It's a, it's a paradox. Um, but the how to do, do that, you know, even not only for, for the individual, but also the country or organizations. So how to solve this issue, uh, how to avoid the data solo is very uh, important. So as I mentioned just now, we need uh, policy and technology. For policy layer, uh, we need some kind of uh, uh, platform to build the global uh, uh, rules, I mean, which can be adopted by every economy. So, so, but up now, there is no international platform to do that. So that's why we hope we will build a global commission on data governance, which will be focused on the data security and personal information uh, protection. Uh, for the second question is for the technologies. You know, there's so many new technologies which, were, which was mentioned by so many uh, peoples. I just want to mention uh, three areas. One is, uh, the, the privacy, uh, privacy computing or multi, multiple security computing. I think it was uh, mentioned by so many people, I don't want to discuss, uh, discuss a lot. Another two I want to mention is one is solid, which calls, uh, calls the social linked data, uh, which was proposed by the, uh, the people, uh, with, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, which the inventor of the uh, World Wide Web is also called the father of the internet. So it's a new, uh, new framework for how to protect the present data. I think it's even up to now, the framework is not perfect, but I think it's, uh, it's a very useful and very uh, uh, constructive solution to protect your present data. And the second is uh, an identifier system, uh, which rely on the dominion system and the blockchain. Why I mentioned dominion system? Because it's, it's the unique, uh, identifier system, which adopted by every, everybody. And a blockchain, I don't want to block, mention a lot, of, a lot of blockchain. So I think it's uh, the most important how to identify the data uh, in a unique namespace and to make sure to protect the ownership of the data and then to encourage people to share the data because the openness and the sharing is the key spirit of the internet. That's my uh, answer. Thank you. Thank you, Xiaodong. Um, due to the limited time, that's all for the Q&A section. Thank you all for your participation. In the era of the digital economy with the internet plus, increasingly integrated into everyday life, we have witnessed the repeat development of big data, AI, and the IoT assets. Modern people are benefiting from the dividends and the confidence brought by the technical, technological progress. Really, it's facing unprecedented risks of a personal information leakage. Through such a workshop, we hope we can jointly discuss how to build a meaningful standard for necessary scope of PI processing and think about the meaning behind it. Especially during the pandemic, we need to classify the rights and the responsibility of each data governance actors and the relationship between them. We are continuing to strengthen the awareness, capacity building, and the fulfillment of the responsibility of each player. To this end, we call on all stakeholders 
to shorten their responsibility, further enhance communication and cooperation. And stringent criminal information protection in routine protect, uh, practice of COVID-19 prevention and control. Working together for a digital future that can guarantee the security of personal information. As previously mentioned, it is recommended that the United Nations establish human-centered global universal rules and frameworks for personal information protection and that the UNIGF play a great role in guiding more stakeholders to engage and jointly build a set of collaborative, trustworthy, and the international community-oriented <coughs> personal information protection, AI rules, and mechanism. With a concentrated effort, we are making some difference in the field of personal information protection and AI governance, hopefully, we will embrace a healthy, sustainable AI future in which our personal information is soundly protected. Thank you all again for your active participation. Look forward to meeting you again next year. Thank you all.